Hey friends, thanks for tuning in for <clears throat> this this sermon whenever, wherever you are. Um, it's going to be a little different. <clears throat> and uh, I've, had a, I've had a lot of chest congestion and uh, have some coughing spurts that may cause me to pause if I record in the normal way and that, was, that would just get complicated. So I'm going to do everything audio and uh, I'm going to throw some images in there. Luckily this is a sermon that can have some some pretty creative images and um we're gonna we're gonna do it like that this time so thanks for bearing uh bearing with me on that but now let's pray amazing god thank you for the opportunity again to dive into your word um as we as we just seek you seek your understanding and to become more like the way that you've called us to be and represent jesus christ so we just ask that you get distractions out of our way so that we can indeed focus on you, your will, your word, your righteousness, and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, friends, let's move on with this week's sermon. We live in a world where we are constantly bombarded with temptation and distractions that pull us away from living a life in Christ. We've been talking about that lately, sin and evil, and the reality that if we choose sin, then we're pulled away from the presence of God and into a place where God is absent. We've talked about belief, believing in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, and living in and entering into an eternity where the presence of God and all of the goodness that comes from God constantly dwells. So today, mingled with our scripture, which we're actually going to read at the end, we'll also have a bit of a history lesson on some particular sins and behaviors that God and past theologians call us to stray from. So, now I know I can't see you, but raise your hand if you've heard the name of Vagrius Ponticus. I wouldn't expect that many of you know that name, and I wouldn't expect it because Vagrius lived in the 300s, so the 4th century, pretty long time ago. But Vagrius Ponticus, what he did was identify eight evil thoughts or passions that could lead to sinful behavior. These were gluttony, lust, avarice, sorrow, anger, sloth, vainglory, and pride. So, even though some of them might look obvious, let's talk about them for, for just a second and connect most of them to uh, some pieces of scripture. So gluttony. Gluttony is mentioned in scripture a few times, and it is mentioned, when it is mentioned, it's bad. It speaks about people who were so overindulged that they totally forgot about God to the point that it would be better for them to be dead. A simple definition of gluttony is eating or drinking inordinately, inordinately, contrary to reason. It is a sin opposed to the virtue of temperance because it is the immoderate indulgence in the delights of food or drink. So gluttony contradicts temperance and can lead someone to abandon God in this gluttonous behavior. Now lust. Lust is one that we probably get wrong. Maybe not wrong, just not complete. We don't have a complete view of it in our modern way of thinking about it. Lust would be these things that Jesus often refers to uh, as the worries and desires and deceitfulness of the world that choke us up and pull us away from God. So the thought or passion of lust that leads to sin is actually in a broad way a strong craving or desire. Of course, that would be a strong craving or desire of something that is contrary to the ways of Christian living and so would pull you away from God. Lust in general could lead 
to many of the sins that we're going to talk about. Then we have avarice. This is a word we don't use very much, but and it's it's really close to greed, but it goes just far beyond greed. Avarice would be an unquenchable desire to gain and hoard things, but not just material things. It comes in the form of entitlement, selfishness altogether, and of course, monetary and material gain. It's this excessive desire to have whatever it is you're after. Almost like, um, you could almost say the phrase, that person's lust for entitlement caused them to lie about their colleague so that they could have their title and satisfy their avarice. It takes greed, which would be more like, man, oh man, I really want that, to the point of, I have to have that, and will do anything for it. Now we have sorrow. I'll be honest, this one was hard to figure out, uh, how to explain it. So I'm going to do my best. So first of all, this is not sorrow for, say, mourning the loss of a loved one. This is sorrow in the instance of sin. So if you sin and are genuinely sorry for it, and it pains you that you have pained God, and then you are led to repent, and then you dwell on it no more, that is good. That is appropriate, and even a kind of holy sorrow. If, however, you're only sorry about the consequences that befall you because of your sins, but you're not really sorry for your sin, for your disobedience, and the fear of those consequences eats away at you, that is bad. That is the sin of sorrow. So hear these words from Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10. And he says, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Now we have anger. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about Cain and Abel. Cain was overcome by the sin of anger, and it caused him to do evil. Anger, like sorrow, is not always a sin, but what we do with that anger can certainly be sinful and evil. We even see Jesus get angry in Scripture, but when he does, it's almost always for the sake of ensuring that God's righteousness is upheld. So you have to ask yourself, what is causing this anger when it arises? What is causing this anger? Sometimes it's because of a sense of pride or sorrow or avarice, and that's not okay. In moments of anger, as hard as it can be, we need to take a step back, take a breath, examine ourselves, and respond spiritually according to Scripture instead of emotionally like Cain. Now we have sloth. Sloth is an interesting one. We often just think of it as laziness, but remember these are all sins or thoughts and passions uh, in the nature of our faith and spirit. So it's not just laziness. You know, sometimes we need a lazy day. <laughs> sometimes we need a sloth day, but uh, in, in the way that we think of it as lazy. But sloth, unlike the other sins, is a sin of omission. So it's a sin of not doing something that you're supposed to be doing, usually because of lack of desire or lack of performance. Sloth may actually come from any of the other sins. For example, a, a, a son may omit or sloth his duty to his father through anger. So I actually found a, a wonderful description of sloth in um, the pocket catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, I, I'm not Catholic, and I know probably anybody watching this are not, um, but the it's we're all in a Christian union here, and they definitely are the prime resources on this on this topic. So what they say is, 
Sloth is the desire for ease, even at the expense of doing the known will of God. Whatever we do in life requires effort. Everything we do is to be a means of salvation. The slothful person is unwilling to do what God wants because of the effort it takes to do it. Sloth becomes a sin when it slows down and even brings to a halt the energy we must expend in using the means to salvation. <clears throat> now we have vain glory. Vain glory, it's like bragging, boasting. Look at me, look at me. Vain glory is the desire to be renowned, to be seen as prestigious uh, in front of others and to be desired. The the lust for vain glory becomes a sin when the person wants to be seen by others above fulfilling their duty to God as a person of faith. It's one thing to be happy with your accomplishments or happy with your situation, but it's quite another to place those above God. Jesus corrects this behavior in Matthew 6, 1 through 8, when he, when he instructs, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray... Do not keep on babbling like pagans, <clears throat> for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And now we have pride. Pride paves the way for us to refuse that God has a sovereign role in everything. So this sinful pride actually leads a person to develop a God complex and challenge the authority of the creator of the universe against their own will. Pride is a big one. It can also be said that the, the pride that Cain had led to the anger that caused him to be overcome by sin and commit evil. Pride will cause someone to discredit the need for others in their community as well as God. A description I found um, makes the strong claim that pride alienates from God, whether consciously or not. The proud are estranged from God. Pride is a self-devotion, self-justification, and self-glorying in contempt of God. This contempt is usually expressed as aversion of God. So, now somewhere along the way, you were probably thinking, hey, he's talking about the seven deadly sins here. Why are there eight? <laughs> Good call. So Evagrius Ponticus made this list of eight in the 300s, but later in the 500s, about 200 years later, uh, Pope Gregory the Great got a hold of this list and figured, hey, if people can't read the Bible to know how to act, they should at least know what not to do. Now, it may not have happened exactly like that, but I kind of have reason to believe that's pretty close. Gregory modified it, modified the list a little bit. He took out vainglory and sorrow, and he sort of meshed them into greed, and then he threw in envy and changed anger to wrath. So, the new list that came about around 1,500 years ago is pride sometimes called vanity, pride, greed, envy, wrath, lust, gluttony,
and sloth. So now, I'm not going to recap all of those, don't worry. But let's read Proverbs 6, 12 through 19. A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks in his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger, with perverted heart, desires evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. <clears throat> the seven deadly sins represent behaviors that are contrary to a life in Christ. Proverbs 6, 12-19 provides a clear warning against the behavior of those who embody the sins listed, and I hear clear parallels to the verses in Proverbs with the, the seven deadly sins and the eight original ones that we talked about. As Christians, we're called to focus on doing good and straying from evil. We must be vigilant against these behaviors and strive to live a life in Christ. As we focus on our life in Christ, not only can we avoid sins that we've spoken about, but we can cultivate the opposite virtues of the sins. Instead of pride, we should strive for humility. Instead of envy, we should cultivate gratitude. Instead of wrath, we should strive for patience. Instead of gluttony, we can cultivate self-control. Instead of sloth, we strive for diligence. Instead of greed, we can cultivate generosity. Instead of lust, we can strive for chastity. And let us pray. Amazing God, we know that your ways are right and true. Our human nature is often overcome by the fleeting desires of sin that draw us away from you and all of the glory that you have for us. We thank you that you have left us with a way to understand your good and perfect will as we seek to stray from sin and become closer to you. Give us now your heart of goodness and courage so that we can draw ever more close to you and so that we can show everyone how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, go from this place in the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, as you, in boldness and confidence, stray from sin and draw yourself closer to God as you go and make disciples.